Saddle up, Brad Kozlowski fans, because your boy just rode you to victory lane. Welcome back to Break Hard. My name is Matt, and yes, after 1,117 days, Brad Keselowski has found his way back to victory lane. As the driver this time, not as the owner. Of course, he's been to victory lane four times with Chris Buescher, and now he finally gets to visit victory lane for his own victory for a team that he co-owned. He gets his first win in that number six car for Roush Fenway Keselowski Racing, becomes the first driver to win a race in a car that he co-owns since Tony Stewart did it at Sonoma in 2016, and it's been a long time coming for Brad. This weekend, he was running that Tom Supra uh, Castro throwback from the 2000s. You play Gran Turismo, you honestly have definitely played with this car before and it's kind of fitting that he took a Toyota paint scheme to victory lane for Ford's first win of the season their first win since Cole Custer won the Xfinity race last year at Phoenix in November they have been winless this season across all three series looked like they might get it done on Friday night in the truck series with Ty Majeski did not get it done that went to Ross Chastain and then uh, Justin Allgaier wins the Xfinity race on Sunday and or on Saturday, and then on Sunday, Brad Keselowski finally breaks through to go to victory lane, not without a wild last what thirty three laps, thirty two laps uh, run for this race. Caution comes out, and uh, it sets up the last pit stop of the race. Brad Keselowski enters the leader, exits in second place behind Tyler Reddick. Tyler Reddick using that first pit stall for winning the pole to his advantage all day long, which honestly, huge uh, hats off to his pit crew because they were doing their job up and down uh, today. And that is not something that you can say for a 2311 pit crew more often than not. But for Brad, he gets off pit road second. Not great. He told the team they asked him what he needed coming down pit road. He said the lead. They didn't give it to him. So he restarts in second, holds on to Tyler Reddick, and they ran side by side handing back and forth the lead for what six seven laps maybe chris busher catches them brad and reddick kind of get into the wall off of turn four busher then swings way down to the inside passes both of them clears them both off into turn one and you're like chris busher is about to sail off and win this race so busher's driving away reddick starts to reel him back in reddick reels him in reels him in like in the bassmaster classic here gets up alongside him and then decides to send it like he's chase briscoe at the bristol dirt race and then he uses up the 17 car they both go into the wall the 45 is now broke he's lumping around and then you have chris busher and it seemed like he might be okay and he wasn't so brad passes the 45 as he's lumping around and honestly nascar not throwing a caution here hats off to them for letting this entire sequence these last 30 laps play out because there was debris coming off of that 45 car that definitely went into the nose of that 11 car of denny hamlin whether it was a brake rotor or something else it was a large piece of debris that bounced and boom right into the front of that yahoo toyota camry the 17 then breaks he comes down to pit road not ideal for either of those drivers. Brad Kozlowski then inherits the lead. And you're like, okay, Brad's going to win this. He's going to do it for the first time since April of 2021 at Talladega. Brad Kozlowski is going to go back to victory lane. Ty Gibbs then tried to reel him in, just couldn't get it done. And great run by Ty Gibbs all day. He had speed and he's going to figure out how to get to victory lane sooner rather than later. Just on Sunday wasn't his day. Josh Berry came home P3. Hats off to him and Rodney Childers because they had that car absolutely rolling late in this race. They were extremely fast on speed, so credit to them. Brad Keselowski, like I said, goes on to win the race, and honestly, this race probably for me, mm, somewhere around like an 88. It was difficult at times for the leaders to pass, right? For somebody to go up and pass the leader. There was good racing throughout the pack, multiple different tire strategies, people short pitting, people running long, and it worked out really well. We'll get to more of that in a second. So the race ends, Brad Keselowski wins. Of course, he wants his patented American flag victory lane celebration or burnout celebration. So they give him the the American flag down there. Cool moment all around. He was, I think, just happy. That's the only word you can describe. Obviously, he's happy, but he was elated in terms of he didn't really know what to say on the radio. He was just like, thank you guys for everything. I'd love to have an American flag if you've got one down there. So they get him an American flag. He does his burnout Polish victory lap, of course, with a name like Keselowski. You got to do a Polish victory lap. He pulls it in, talks to Jamie Little. There's a man climbing up on the fence. I don't know what his deal was like. It was at Richmond, but this is Darlington. He was up there celebrating. Brad Kozlowski just got him feeling some kind of way. So credit to him. Fox is watching the bro- or the burnout happen. And then for some reason, they just circled one of the guy's butts, just like caked up right here. And they wanted everybody to see it. So 
that was an interesting thing as well. And then, as Brad's going to Victory Lane, they cut to Chris Buescher, and he gets out of his car, and he's walking down towards the 45 of Tyler Reddick like he's about to enter a UFC octagon. Tyler Reddick's like, I'm going to keep my helmet on right now. And Buescher goes up and shoves him. Weirdly enough, it's exactly what Tyler Reddick should have done, like I mentioned before, at the Bristol Dirt Race. When Chase Briscoe sent in on him, they both lost the race, and Kyle Busch goes on to win the, take victory. That's what Reddick should have done back then, and Chris Buescher does it this time. And he walks up and he shoves Tyler Reddick. Reddick, a tiny guy, Chris Buescher, a stocky guy, Ryan Newman, reincarnated. Newman's not gone, but you get the point here. And he's like, I keep my helmet on here. And he just kept apologizing. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I fucked up, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Busher's like, yeah, no shit, you messed up. And Busher says potentially the lamest thing you could ever say in a fight. And he says, I don't have a sticker. Chris, if you want me to run down to Dwayne Reed and get you a sticker, I'll do it, man. Like, that's going to calm you down right now. Obviously, he was referring to a win sticker, which kind of allows Tyler Reddick to send it in there because he's already locked into the playoffs. Busher's not locked into the playoffs yet. Last week at Kansas, he lost by one one thousandth of a second in the closest NASCAR finish ever. This week at Darlington... Seems like he might have a chance to win, and he gets absolutely used up by that 45 car of Tyler Reddick. So, yeah, those last 30 laps were honestly some of the better racing we've seen in a long time, or at least dramatic, because there was a lot that happened there, which was honestly pretty pretty interesting um, as it all played out. Stage three, of course, this was set up by Kyle Larson's spin. Uh, Larson out there won stage one in that five car for Texas Terry. Texas Terry would be proud. Terry's not dead. He was at the race today, but NASCAR socials kept saying that. And it's like, I, dude, he's here. He actually even wore an, a replica fire suit to what Kyle Larson was wearing today. So shout to HendrickCars.com for getting Terry his own fire suit with his own TL branding on the belt as well. I thought that was a nice little touch. He rode around in the truck with uh, Kyle Larson for pre-race for driver introduction, signed a bunch of autographs, was up in the booth for stage two. And honestly, stage two went on for so long, they almost had to start paying Terry because he was up there putting in too many hours. Stage two in this race felt like it went on forever. And then randomly, they'd be like, what do you think, Terry? After we haven't heard from him in, I don't know, 20 minutes. And he's like, oh yeah, these cars are hard to drive. All right. <laughs> then just kind of went away again. Uh, I love Terry Labonte. Terry, Terry Labonte. Shout out to the uh, RC Track NASCAR uh, and the people that tuned into the live streams of that during the pandemic. That was a long time ago. So Larson ends up fencing it, does not get back-to-back -back wins uh, to start off his month of May, which honestly would have just really, really put full steam behind the hype train as he heads to Indianapolis uh, tomorrow or tonight, whenever that is. Overall, like I said, this race was really solid. There are some dull points, of course. At times, it was hard for the leaders, for somebody to go up and battle the leaders without having lap traffic. If you had lap traffic, it made things a lot more interesting. The race started off before we even got cars on track. We had the national anthem happening, and I thought we had a mannequin up on stage, like Kim Cattrall was just standing there for a moment, and then all of a sudden this woman just came to life, and she's finally started moving her arms. But for a moment there, I thought they had just rolled a dummy out on stage, like a uh, a mannequin dummy, not an actual. I don't think she is actually dumb. My apologies if, if she does believe that. Stage one, like I said, there was some interesting pitch strategy here as well. Um, Bo Wallace and that number 23 car, they ran long. And at first it was like, this isn't going to really work out. But it did. It net gained them eight spots. And that was massive for them. I think I believe it scored them a stage point as well. So credit to Booty for making the right call there and getting that done. There's also a very funny moment a little bit later in the race when they're trying to decide on what pit call to have and Booty forgot what Bubba's mom's name was and he keys up the mic and he says, what's Bubba's mom's name to Freddie? And he says, Desi, it's because you forgot, didn't you? <laughs> and he goes ahead and calls it, Booty does, and Bubba came over the radio and said, you had to look that up. I know you had to look that up. So it was a funny exchange um, between them. In stage two, John Hunter Nemechek spins out and has a flat tire, tries to get to pit road, can't do it because he has flat tires. And with this car, flat tires is essentially just the end of the end of your existence on track. Listen, if you're running that poorly all day, as John Hunter was, you don't get the choice of whether you want to push or a tow back to pit lane. You just get hooked up and towed back. Like, we're not doing this nonsense because that caution took forever, forever, in the words of Squints, and it absolutely did not need to be. We also had another interesting moment where, on a restart, everything stacked up. The 24 car of William Byron was 
three wide inside. Martin Truex Jr. in the middle, Ryan Blaney up top. 24 is inside. The 19 ends up using a little bit more racetrack and gets into, it was kind of an accordion effect. Boom, 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 up the racetrack. Blaney smacks the wall. That stacks, stacks up everybody behind him. Nobody actually wrecked, uh, but NASCAR still threw a caution for it. Blaney's day was done because the damaged vehicle policy clock expired. He goes back out on track and nearly takes a side swipe at the 24 of William Byron, which I guess if your sister's not dating him anymore, you don't have to be buddies any longer. So he can go out there and make a aggressive move like that. But, you know, the season has not started off great for the defending champ. And I think he was just pretty frustrated. Looking over my notes here, I don't think we have anything else major that needs to be talked about other than the fact that Brad Keselowski, back in victory lane. A couple days ago, when I did my throwback paint scheme, winners and losers, I forgot to include Brad in part one. The RFK admin bullied me into, <laughs> into including him. I was always going to in part two. And I'm glad I did because Brad Keselowski getting back to victory lane is good for the sport. It's good for him. It's good to have parity like this. The Fords, as... Kevin Harvick mentioned on the broadcast on Saturday, the Fords are trying to bring more horsepower to the racetrack. And I know some people right now are very confused by that. But essentially, these engines aren't built to 670 horsepower. These engines are built, and then NASCAR you know, has a tapered spacer that puts on them that restricts them to somewhere around 670 horsepower. And Ford's idea behind this was they're going to update their engines and try to bring more horsepower to the racetrack. That meaning if you put that tapered spacer on, yeah, it's obviously still going to restrict it down in that 670 ballpark, but maybe they'll have 673 or something along those lines. So Ford ends up getting three in the top five, Josh Berry and Chase Briscoe, rounding out your top five after uh, Brad Keselowski wins. He also ended up with five in the top 10. Justin Haley on speed in that Rick Ware car, P9, and Michael McDowell, Spire Motorsports' newest driver, as it'll finish out the season at FRM, finishes P10. So great day for, for those guys. Great speed for Justin Haley. Great speed for the four car of Josh Berry as well, especially at a time where the SHR you know rumor mill continues to absolutely churn every single hour of the day, it feels like, at this point. So credit to all those guys. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this race. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.